I think there's two statements in the in Genesis that are of equivalent importance, actually. Um, one of them, maybe there's three. One of them is that what God used to create order out of potential and chaos was something approximating a process that was characterized by truth and courage. And so there's, a, there's an idea there, which is why I think God continually repeats after he creates day after day that the creation was good. And so the idea is that if you face the potential of the world, which is, I think, something that human beings do with their consciousness, I think that's what consciousness is for, if you face the world with truth and courage, then what you generate out of that field of possibilities is in fact good. Even though the price, the pr you may pay a price for the truth in the short term, it's an act of faith even in some sense, which reflects that axiomatic presupposition that there's nothing that's going to improve the world more than forthright confrontation with the structure of reality and an attempt to abide by the truth. And then you have that second statement, which is a miraculous statement, I believe. And it's hard to see it as, as anything else, um, that both men and women are made in the image of God. We've, we've already had God established as the creator and the creator who creates in a certain ethical manner. And then that power or ability or virtue or privilege or responsibility is transferred to human beings and it's transferred to men and women. And I also find that actually quite stunning, you know, because there's no shortage of postmodern slash feminist criticism of the Judeo-Christian tradition claiming that it's fundamentally oppressive and patriarchal. And yet right at the beginning, you have this incredible statement, which, which seems to fly in the face of its of the anachronistic nature of the document, stating that it's not just men that are made in the image of God, it's men and women. And that's, and that's, it isn't obvious to me how that conclusion was reached so long ago. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. And, and it's also important to note that historically speaking, if you look at surrounding documents, documents from Mesopotamia, typically the, the actual language that was used, the image of God language is actually not unique to the Bible. That exists in other cultures. But it was always the king who was made in the image of God. Right. So it was the people who were most powerful who were right, made in the right, image of God. Right. The extension of that to all human beings is a unique moment in, in philosophical history. And as you say, the idea that God has created an orderly universe and that we have the capacity to act out within that universe and to see God from behind, so to speak, that we can't necessarily see his face, but we can see sort of the general mm -hmm. outline of what he is intending. And then uh, another verse from Genesis that, that I think is deeply important is from the Cain and Abel story. The, the verse where God says to Cain, Tim Shell, that you have the ability to do better than this. Right. And Cain comes to him and he says, you know, I, why didn't you accept my sacrifice? And God says, well, it's in your control. You know, go out and do something about it. And then, of course, Cain rejects that. And it, it's, that right. story is so deep. And I think it really is the story of what's happening right now. People, right. Well, yeah, God's people, reaction to Cain. Capacity. Yeah, exactly. God, you have God's, it. God's reaction to Cain is that I rejected you because you could do better. Right. And that's and, actually a kind of compliment, even though, you know, if you're not offering up the proper sacrifices and things aren't working out for you, it might not be the kind of compliment that you want to hear, but it is a testament to the potential of the human spirit. And so you're making the case in your book, and, and this is, the, this is an, what would you call an injunction, an encouragement to the Enlightenment types to look to their axioms and to think hard about how it could be that the idea of individual democratic freedom, for example, and all of the wonderful explicit political uh, ideas that came out of the Enlightenment could have possibly emerged. And right. I do agree that you have to have that initial conception of the individual as sovereign and, and that that sovereignty has to be associated with something akin to recognition of divinity, at least insofar as what's regarded as divine is regarded as the highest of all possible values. And, and it is absolutely surprising, as you pointed out, that not only is the idea of the image of God extended to men and women, but that it is not, explicitly not, the domain of kings, um, who in fact might be more at risk for abandoning their actions as avatars of God, so to speak, than those who are in privation. You know, you see that consistently in the Old Testament, uh, 
where the kings are being taken to task constantly by prophets who do appear to speak more in the language of God, let's say. And then you see it also in the New Testament with the, with the insistence that the wealthy and powerful have impediments to proper ethical action that those who are less materially fortunate might not face. Yeah, I mean, that, that thematic is, is present, obviously, in the Old Testament. There's actually a, a passage where it's talking about the sacrifices. I believe it's in the book of Leviticus, where it talks about bringing uh, accidental sin sacrifices. And it talks about the common man. It says, if you shall sin, then you bring the sacrifice. And then it says, w with regard to uh, the prince, the Nasi, it says, with regard to the prince, the, the Hebrew word is ka'asher. It says, when you will sin. So the assumption is that if you have great power, the chances of your sinning are going to be greater because you are going to conceive of yourself as higher than others. And this is going to lead you down a pretty dark path. The, the point with regard to the Enlightenment is that we actually have some counter evidence of the Enlightenment being awesome all the way through if it is predicated solely on reason and not on a historic understanding of, of these principles. And that is the French Enlightenment. I mean, and this was one of my key points when, when I was looking at, at Pinker's book, Enlightenment Now, which again, you and I agree on this. I have great enlightenment for Pinker. I took a class with him when I was at Harvard Law School. He did a joint class with Alan Dershowitz. That was kind of fun. But Pinker goes a 450 page book about the Enlightenment and he never mentions the French Revolution once. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought, I, I don't know how that's historically possible to do. The Enlightenment was not just David Hume and Adam Smith and the American Founding Fathers, the Enlightenment also was Rousseau and Voltaire and Robespierre, and it was the, and it was the German progressive Enlightenment that had a real dark side. I mean, it, it's, human reason can lead you to a lot of different very bad places. The, the metaphor that I like to use with regard to Western civilization is that Western civilization is a, is a suspension bridge. And then on one, and it's, and it's over a river of, as you would say, chaos. And on the one end of the bridge, the, the big pole, is these fundamental assumptions you have to make about the nature of the world that I don't believe could be arrived at other than through some form of divine revelation. This would be the Judeo-Christian tradition. And those principles are things like we have free choice. That's an assumption you have to make and is not implicit in scientific materialism. Mm -hmm. The idea that history has a progressive nature, that you can improve yeah. the world around you. Again, that is not a, it, that, that is reliant on an assumption you have to make. The idea that human beings are held to a morality that they themselves do not subjectively create out of emotional me. And that is something that you have to make an assumption about. The, thing, the idea of objective truth itself is something you have to make an assumption about. And that's an assumption that I think can be made most specifically by the idea that there is a mind outside of us that creates that objective truth and stands behind an ordered universe. Right? All of those well, are assumptions from Judeo-Christian well, values. Well, I also think there's evidence for, for much of this. You know, one of the things that I've been discussing with my audiences is like, you know, it depends obviously on what you're willing to take as evidence. But it isn't obvious to me at all that you can establish a functional relationship with yourself unless you hold yourself responsible for your actions and you regard yourself as a, a free agent, in, at least in some regards. Like, obviously, we're not omniscient, omni omnipresent, and omnipotent. That's clearly the case. We're subject to stringent limitations. And there are situations in which our actions devolve into determinism. That's obvious neurophysiologically. It has to be the way the world works, is that once you execute a decision, there comes to a point where that decision is manifested in something approximating a deterministic manner. I think mm -hmm. the evidence for that is overwhelming, but that doesn't mean that when you're looking out into the future and you're contemplating the many paths that you could take, that what you do to make your decisions then is deterministic in a simple, in a simple manner. I think if that was the case, there'd be no need for consciousness at all. And then I look at how people react to themselves is we hold ourselves responsible despite our own inclination for the sins that we manifest, for the manners in which we wander off the path. People wake up at four in the morning and they berate themselves for the actions they took that they knew they shouldn't and the inaction that they manifested when they knew they should have acted. And if we were masters in our own house without that central moral compass, there'd be no reason at all for us to wake up and torture ourselves to death with our moral um, inequity. And right. then if you have a friend or a family member and you insist upon treating them as if they're a deterministic agent with no effect on the future and no responsibility for their choices, it's actually impossible to have a relationship with them. You can't even have a relationship with a two or three-year-old if you 
insist upon infantilizing them in that manner and not attributing to them the choice that enables valid punishment, let's say, on the one hand, you've done something wrong and you need to be held accountable for it, but also valid accomplishment on the other, which is that you've done something that you didn't have to do, that was voluntary, that's deserving of approbation and reinforcement. And yep. we act that out. And, and then the next level of evidence seems to be that if you found your polity on propositions other than that, that the sovereignty of the individual and the responsibility of the individual, the whole thing goes sideways so rapidly that it's almost indescribable. And it, it doesn't just go sideways, it goes sideways and down. And so like, I don't know exactly what to make of that as a proof. You know, it, it's a strange sort of proof, the proof being that, well, there doesn't seem to be any reasonable way for human beings to organize their social interactions at any level of social organization without accepting those initial, I would say, right. Judeo-Christian assumptions. Th this is right. And then, then this is where the, the main debate happens between me and Sam Harris, because Sam will reason himself to those assumptions and away from those assumptions and to those assumptions in a way. He'll, he'll use those assumptions in building other assumptions. And I, I've said to him before, I feel like you're using bricks from a house that you just torn, tore down. So you, you, you can't really do that. And this is why I say, on the one hand, you have to have those Judeo-Christian assumptions. And those, by the way, undergird even the very concept of reason, because the idea of reason is that you are using a willful process of thought in order to convince someone else, predicated on the notion that the other person's opinion is valuable and that you shouldn't just club them over the head and take their stuff. I mean, the, the reason right. has, the value of reason has implicit moral biases. And those moral biases, you can't reason your way to. As yes, I said to well, Sam, well, from an evolutionary yeah. biology perspective, there's no reason for reason other than if you think that maybe you can convince, uh, unless, especially in a world of non-mass communication, what is the reason for reason, right? In, in a world that pre-exists mass communication, what is the reason that you need reason? Wouldn't force be more effective? For most of human history, it was. It was significantly more effective than well, reason. It, it's, certainly, it's certainly what the radicals on the left would argue even now. I mean, and the idea of reason seems to be predicated, so, and, and that would go along with the idea of free speech, which I think is also equally, um, grounded in these underlying axioms is that, you know, each of us as sovereign individuals have a valid mode of existence about, and there's something unique about that valid mode of existence. And it's also something that can be communicated. And that part of the reason for rational discussion is that the ability to share that unique and valuable element of private experience with someone else is salutary but it's also salutary, salutary in a manner that allows for the mutual spiritual transformation of both of the people that are involved in the discussion. And yep. it seems to me that you can't, if you're pro-reason, you've already bought that argument. Exactly, this is exactly right. And so faith and reason to this extent are not intention. Faith undergirds reason, because you have to make us fundamental assumptions even to get to reason. And this is why I think that one of the things that has happened, and it's really unfortunate, I discussed it at, at, in the last chapters of the book, is that when you take away the assumptions that undergird reason, reason itself collapses in. It's not that reason sustains up here on top of the structure. Once the structure falls, reason falls with it too. And we return to our sort of tribal naturalistic roots that, that are quite dangerous. This is why I say that you need Jerusalem on one end of the bridge. The other end of that suspension bridge is reason, meaning that we can't be theocrats. We can't look at fundamentalist religious texts and take them as as complete literal as completely literal and then hope to develop as a civilization on the basis of that complete literalism so you have to look to which of these commandments for example in the torah are directed toward hum eternal human nature so i would suggest that commandments that, that are directed toward reigning in certain appetites are directed toward god's understanding of human nature that certain injunctions with regard to how we behave in the Ten Commandments, these are predicated on, a, on an understanding of human nature that is truly profound and worthwhile preserving. It's also worth noting that the story of Western civilization is the expansion of these principles out from the tribal and toward a broader range of humanity. And that's why the book is not just an argument, here's how I interpret the Bible and here's why that's right. It's, it's an argument that historical development was necessary after the Bible. So it is not just that the Bible solves all your problems, it's that God understands, even from a religious perspective in Judaism, and I think in Christianity too, that we are going to apply human reason 
to these texts. That's from a religious perspective. From a non-religious perspective, okay. the point I'm making is that you have to take these fundamental assumptions, whether you like them or not, that are religiously rooted, and then apply your reason to develop from the fundamental assumptions that we have already stated. Okay. And that, okay. then that okay. tension is what allows the suspension bridge to continue to function. That doesn't mean that it, it is always equally solid throughout time. It isn't, because the tension sometimes wavers, sometimes reason takes dominance, sometimes Judeo-Christian values or, or Judaic biblical literalism takes, takes dominance. And if you, bottom line is, you collapse reason, you end up with theocracy. You collapse Judeo-Christian values, you end up with nihilism, is sort of the, the basic argument. Okay, okay. So, 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 you know, one of the things that, that Sam is afraid of, and, you know, there's some validity in this fear, and I think he tends to apply this more to, to the, the state of Islamic fundamentalism, but For the sure. same argument can be made with the other religious traditions. Um, you know, uh, uh, evangelical Christianity, for example, and maybe Orthodox Judaism, who knows, that the danger is that we'll take these revealed truths, which differ, and that holding them as absolute revealed truths will make us parochial and tribal, and the consequence of that will be all sorts of catastrophe and horror. Right. But then, you know, one of the things I learned when I was studying the Old Testament, and this was very interesting, um, a Jewish friend of mine, Norman Deutsch, sort of clued me into this because one of the things he told me was that Christians who emphasize the New Testament tend to parody the Old Testament God to a somewhat unfair degree, casting him as much more tyrannical in some sense. The God of wrath, yeah, God yeah. of justice versus mercy, yep. Right, That's exactly, right. exactly. And so I took that seriously, and especially when I was reading the Abrahamic stories. And, you know, you see you see throughout the earliest writings, the idea that in some bizarre sense, God can be bargained with. Right. And, and, and so you see that even in the Cain and Abel story, because Cain actually faces God with his complaints and says, well, you know, here's how I look at the world. And God excoriates him because he believes that he's looking at the world improperly. And I think for good reason. But there is the implication that you could have a conversation with God and hypothetically right. learn something. And, but then it, that transforms even more when you see the, the, the stories that follow. So Abraham directly intercedes with God on, on, in, in favor of Sodom, right? Right. Because, and, and he makes a pretty, what would you say, extreme case for redeeming Sodom which seems to have degenerated into quite, the, into quite the state of hell, trying to entice God into not being more destructive than necessary if there's any goodness to be found. And he actually does that successfully. And so that's right. very interesting. So even though God is absolute in his judgment in some fundamental sense, there is this capacity for dialogue, which seems to be an analogy to the idea that reason and revelation can coexist and and, 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 and bolster each other in some sort of upward development. Well, this is exactly right. And, and the idea of natural law, which the seeds are there in the Judaic value system, I think natural law is more fully fleshed out in sort of Greek teleological sense when, when they talk about the idea that the Aristotle, Plato, when they talk about the idea that you can look at the world around you and discover the purposes of the world around you simply by using reason. Well, in the, in the Judaic sense, there's the idea that God abides by the moral code that he himself created, and you can ask him questions about it. In fact, the very name Israel is, in, in Hebrew, it's Yisrael. Yisrael literally means struggle with God. Yes, so, yes, yes. So, well, that, that, that was the other thing I was going to bring up, the direct thing I was going to bring up, is that, yeah. that there is this, and that's a remarkable, that's a remarkable story, that it's, it's, it's Jacob. I always get Jacob and Joseph confused. Right. <laughs> Jacob. Yeah, it's Jacob on right. the other and, side and, of the river Jacob, before he meets Esau. Right, yep. Exactly, exactly. On the other side of the river. So he hasn't crossed back to his homeland, right? He hasn't returned home after his hero's journey. He sent his wife and his children and his belongings ahead to try to make peace with the brother that he's seriously betrayed. And, and he's had his adventures and maybe he's learned his lessons. But then he's on the bank <laughs> of the river and he's visited by an angel who appears to be God. And he wrestles with him all night and he comes out damaged, right? Which is an indication that this is sort of like the, the Egyptian idea when Horus encounters Seth and has his eye torn out. That there's some high probability of damage that it, 
if you encounter the divine, even, even in some positive sense. But he wrestles with him all night and then defeats God, apparently, in some sense, and, and is allowed to move forward with his adventure and then is given this new name. And the name really struck me when I started thinking about it because what it does imply, I think this is such a positive message and, and, and I don't know how to reconcile it precisely with the Jewish claim of, of chosenness as a people because my reading of, the, of that particular text seemed to imply that the chosen people are precisely those who do in fact wrestle with God and so that they, they take these ethical questions seriously. They're not um, accepting them without question and without thought because there's no wrestling then. Right. But, but, but the, the real morality comes in the in the struggle between the revelation and the mm -hmm. and the and, and 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 the freedom for thought and choice.